Are you ready to overcome the complexities and burdens that come with your success? Join the team at Centura Wealth Advisory in the Live Life Liberated podcast. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Live Life Liberated with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. Today, Kyle Malmstrom has a return guest. This is exciting. Kyle, who have you brought back on the show? Ken Van Dam. Woo-hoo. Super excited to have him. All right. What are you guys talking about today? We're going to be talking about the salt deduction workaround that Gavin Newsom just passed in July uh, with the Small Business Relief Act. So it's a hot topic. It's very timely. It affects Californians in a large way, business owners. And so getting to the bottom of it, we brought in the expert Ken Van Dam to help us figure out the pitfalls and, and how people can use this strategy to save themselves a truckload of tax. Nice. So, Ken, thanks for joining us today. Welcome back. Thank you, Kyle. It's good to be here. Thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. Glad to be here. Well, I, you know, it's been probably about a year since you were on the last podcast, and super happy to have you. So today, well, why don't you remind everybody just, uh, you know, what you do and who you serve and, and, and what your background is. Sure. Uh, sure, Kyle. Uh, again, name's Ken Van Dam. I'm a tax partner at Ernst & Young in the San Diego office. I uh, specialize. I'm in the private client service group of Ernst & Young, so I specialize in high net worth individuals and their business real estate operations. So I've been doing this for 31 years. Well, thanks for joining us today. On July 16th, 2021, Governor Gavin Newsom signed the Assembly Bill 150. It did 26 things, but Section 15 enacted the Small Business Relief Act. Now, the Small Business Relief Act has a tax provision in there that we're going to talk about today. But to give a little context, I'd like to go down memory lane and talk about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and what that meant for Californians, New Yorkers, people in in high-income tax states. So, Ken, uh, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act got signed into law. What what transpired for Californians? Sure. That's that that's actually a great question because that's where this starts. Um, and, and a lot of this made uh, mainstream media. So I imagine a lot of listeners have heard about this. But in 2018, that federal bill limited the ability for individuals to claim as deductions their state and local taxes. Um, it, that bill basically said an individual can only claim up to $10,000 of their real estate taxes and state income taxes, city taxes, lo- local taxes, when before it was unlimited. And as a result, if you live in a high tax rate state like California, it doesn't take much in real estate taxes and state and local income taxes to reach $10,000. So what we find is a lot of individuals, for the most part, lost their ability to deduct most of their state and local taxes on their federal return. And uh, many states have been trying to find a way to get around that rule. And and this AB 150 bill that you mentioned is addressing that issue for California taxpayers. That it is, right? The Democrats kind of threw a fit over it. And and rightfully so, right? I mean, it really increased the, in, the effective income tax for residents of California, New York, and Connecticut, and different states. So AB 150 in the Small Business Relief Act, what is it? What is it that we're talking about, and and what is? how does it work? So what, so what AB 150 is, is a response to this federal limitation. And, and just for context, California is not the first state to do it. Connecticut actually was the first state to do it two years ago. And the reason why California and about 20 other states are doing it now is because the IRS issued a notice in December saying that they will f- they will allow the Connecticut tax based on the Connecticut rule to be deductible. So many states, including California, are now following suit. Every state's a little bit different, and um, and California is is frankly, very different. It's, it's got some, some issues that we need to talk through, but let me try to explain what it is. So real quick, just to be, to be real clear, Ken, it's it is for small businesses, right? So you have to have a qualified business, correct? What, what qualifies as a, as a qualifying entity? 
That, that's right, Kyle, Kyle. It is for small businesses. Specifically, it's for small businesses that uh, conducts business through partnerships and S corporations. If you're a business that is through a single member LLC or a sole proprietorship, you will not qualify for AB 150. It specifically has to be a partnership or an S corporation. And even then, if it's a partnership, it only works if the partnerships partners are individuals, trusts, and S corporations. In other words, you cannot have a multi-tier partnership structure and a partnership that has a partner that is also a partnership will not qualify. It's confusing. It's complicated, yeah. but that's the way they wrote the rules. So we got partnerships and S-Corps. So that's who's eligible. And now what is it? How does it work? How do, what, what does AB 150 allow those qualified entities to do? Sure. I, let me try to explain some, uh, some, uh, in simple terms, but then it gets in, let us get into nuances later in simple terms. What the law says is that the entity at the election of the partners and shareholders, the entity can pay a California tax equal to 9.3% on the entity's taxable income. Let's say, for example, the entity earns $100,000 of taxable income. That means the entity would pay a tax of $9,300. The entity still issues a K-1 to the partners or shareholders, reporting the $100,000 of California taxable income. The partners determine their tax at the individual level on that $100,000 of taxable income, but then apply a credit for the $9,300 taxes paid by the entity. The intention is, in basic principles, is that the entity is going to pay the tax and not the individual. And with the entity paying the tax, the entity would deduct that tax against their federal taxable income. So on your federal K-1, you will get a deduction for that, in my example, $9,300 of state taxes paid by the entity. So when you walk through, that doesn't sound like how most people, I think, would anticipate that formula to work, right? We talked about this earlier in the week. It's, the way it's written uh, and the way most people would think about it isn't necessarily how it, it behaves. And so let's touch upon that because on first glance, you would say, yeah, I made hundred grand and I'm going to deduct $9,300. So now my taxable income's eighty or 90300 right? Mm -hmm. Or seven hundred ninety thousand seven hundred, and that is not exactly the formula. And, and there's some there's some nuance here that specifically why you're on the call today or, or on this podcast is to help walk through that so people understand how that works. Yeah, there's there's several nuances that you got to be really careful. And and I'll preface this by saying that this law is brand new. The state of California has not issued any guidance, so in some respects we have questions that do not have answers for yet. And as soon as we get those answers, maybe we can do another podcast. But for now, we'll talk through those nuances and I'll give you, you know, at least our opinion or our thoughts on the risks that you need to be thinking of as you make this decision. The, the first one is it's in context of partnerships or S corporations and each partner or shareholder gets to make their own election in or out. So imagine, Kyle, you and I were partners, either in a partnership or an S corporation, and, and one of us chose to elect in and one of us chose to elect out. We do not have guidance from the state of California or the IRS, for that matter, as to whether we can specially allocate this deduction. So imagine I have the entity pay a tax on my behalf, but I only get half the deduction because you own 50% and the other 50% is being allocated to you. That's not logical how it should work. But like I said, without guidance, we don't know exactly what the IRS or state of California is going to do about that issue. So let's talk about the mechanics of the election and how that works. So walk us through that, Ken. How do the partners elect in and out? Because you bring up a good point about, you know, the guidance that hasn't been issued, but mechanically speaking, or, or, you know, check the box. How's that work? 
Well, th that's a good question. This law is effective for the 2021 tax year. Being the initial year, they want uh, the partnerships and, sh and S corporations to make the election by March 15th of 2022. And, Hang on, and March 15th is already over. How do we do that? <laughs> no, March 15th, 2022, next year. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and that's just the one, you know, that's just the transition rule. The elect in, you got till March 15, 2022. That will give the state enough time, hopefully, to issue some guidance and also tell us how to make the election because there's no form yet to file. We don't know what that form is going to look like. But it, in, in theory, there should be a form to file with the partners, each partners and each shareholder's ability to elect in or out. So when do you have to pay the tax by, though? Can you pay the tax by March 15th? How do you get a Yeah, the law says for the first year, pay the tax by March 15th. Now, it's different for 2022, 2023, but for the first year, the taxes will be due March 15th. If, you are, if your entity is a cash basis entity, you might want to pay by December 31st in order to get the tax deduction in 2021. If your entity is an accrual basis entity, it might be possible to deduct the taxes on an accrual basis, even though the taxes are going to be paid March 15th, 2022. I think I'll take the safe road on that one and pay before December 31st. What if I overpay? Yeah, that's a good question. It actually gets into a couple other risk areas. Um, it's, it's, and it, this is the first you know, risk area. If the entity pays a 9.3% tax, it will. it is not a refundable tax. Once it's paid, it's not refundable. And so when that 9.3% tax is paid by the entity and then a credit is then issued to the individuals who are the partners and shareholders, the partners and shareholders have to determine if they can use that credit. And if they can't, it's not refundable. It is credit. It can carry over though for four years. So if a partner or shareholder cannot use the full amount of the taxes paid by the entity, they can carry it over for the next four years and hope that they get it to to to, to take the credit in one of those four years. And I will tell you, the state of California, when they when they created this bill, they actually scored it as a revenue raiser. They actually think some people are going to um, pay more in taxes because of this non-refundable issue. So you gotta be very careful. Before you make this election, I think you have to model out whether you're gonna benefit from the election. Well, yeah, if it's not refundable, that's not good. So how do how do I know if I'm paying too much? What's the gotcha in this? I mean, is it just 9.3%? I don't, uh, yeah. it is, I, I know it's not. So walk us through kind of a little of the math there. How do you end up overpaying in this situation? <laughs> Well, there's a couple ways you can overpay. Uh, one is the California income tax rates are a graduated rate system. Uh, for low income taxpayers, it's 0%, 1%. For high income taxpayers, it goes all the way up to 13.3%. So the, the first gotcha is if you're in a low income uh, uh, tax bracket at an individual level, let's say you pay 5% taxes. If the entity pays 9.3% taxes, obviously you won't be able to use all of the credit. You're only going to be maybe yep. maybe be able to use 5%, and the other 4.3% would be carried over. There's another though, gotcha uh, or potential gotcha. We really need guidance on this issue. The the legislation AB 150 had some very tricky wording as to how they describe the credit. And as you go through that wording and you go through the existing law, it, it, we think it's possible that this credit is going to be limited at the individual level to the individual's alternative minimum tax. And I, I probably need to explain this better. So, you know, give me another minute or two here. Most people in California, generally speaking, are not subject to California's alternative minimum tax. Uh, so many people probably aren't aware of it, but there is an alternative minimum tax. And what that tax is basically is that you recalculate your taxable income, adding and subtracting adjustments 
as prescribed by law, and then multiplying your uh, your your alternative alternative minimum taxable income by a tax rate of seven percent. So I'm I'm going to generalize this. So so you know, bear with me, but I want to generalize it in order to just get a concept across. Basically. AMT says you're going to pay at least 7% tax rates at the individual level. Now, if the credit is really limited by AMT, that means you can use some of your credit to get your regular tax rate down to 7%, but it can't go below 7%. So imagine, even if you're in the highest income tax bracket, you make more than a million dollars of taxable income. And so you're in that 13.3% tax bracket for California. You could maybe take use this credit to get your 13.3% down to 7%. So you use 6.3% of, of the credit. But the entity paid 9.3%. So you end up paying 3% more in the current year and hope that you can use that credit the next year or the next four years. That's a, that's a potential gotcha that you got to be careful about. There's exemptions for small businesses and low income taxpayers. So it's going to, it's going to be different depending on your individual circumstances, but you really need to model this out. But this is one of the potential gotchas in the law is that they think the entity, California thinks the entity is going to pay 9.3% tax and that's going to be too much tax for a lot of the California individual partners and shareholders. But to the math on that, can you know, if you own an S corp, you got to pay yourself wages. So there's a wage component to it. Mm -hmm. But I think the gist of it is, hey, you got to get in there with your CPA. You got to run the numbers, and you got to make sure that you don't want to overpay. If you don't want to overpay, you got to do the math. You got to do the projections. That's all there is to it. That that's right. You know, if half your income's coming from a K one, the other half of income's come from wages, dividends, interest. Maybe you're okay because the 9.3% tax is only being paid on half your income while your California income tax is based on 100% of your income. And so maybe your credit won't be limited by AMT. It is a very complicated mathematical formula, and there's no way around it other than just model out your projected taxable income and, and do, the, do these calculations. So let's walk there's through a, this. So that sequence, though, if I have till March... To make a payment, let's just say I make a 9.3% payment. I just decide I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to overpay for whatever projections I run with. And I run and I do that. And then I have to make another payment for 2022 if I'm a cash basis company by the end of the year. So now I've made two payments in the same year. Now, if you didn't do your projections, you got real risk that you did overpay, right? Everyone's situation is pretty specific, but now you're in that situation where you've made two payments in one year and what if you did overpay it's going to carry forward you know i think one of the strategies we were talking about was maybe you choose it this year and then don't choose it next year uh, some way to let that credit that overpayment if, if you end up doing that wash out right that would be one way to go around that and you talked about what if you have multiple entities what do you do with multiple entities yeah, good questions. To your point, I think we need guidance on some of these issues. Again, I I don't know if you get the credit in 2021 or 2022 if on a cash basis you pay the pastor any tax in 2022. Yep. I don't know whether they give the credit in 2021 yeah, or 2022. I'd hope it'd be 2021, but I'd like to see guidance that says that. If If you are trying to find creative ways to manage your pastor any tax so that you don't um, you don't risk losing some in the non-refundable nature of it then if you have multiple entities you might choose to pay this this entity tax for some of your pastor entities and not others pick and choose uh, pick and choose the right combination that based on your your projections gets you ballpark the right amount of uh, entity tax and the credit so that you don't risk, um, you know, losing some. Um, and if you only have one entity, yeah, maybe you, you you do it in 2021, pay the entity tax in 2021, and then skip year. 
2022 and let the credit carryover from 2021 be applied to 2022. Uh, I think you'd, there's some creative ways, I think, to manage this credit, but it's the point is, and I hope everybody gets this, the point is just don't make this election like it's a no-brainer because it's not a no-brainer. You really got to to uh, run the numbers. Yeah, I totally agree, but it you got to remember, okay, hey, we're talking about business owners and they got to do all this math. Now let's talk about um, what if you don't have an entity, uh, but I have rental. What um, somebody out there is going to be thinking to myself? Well, I'll just start an entity, right? What do you think? About I, well, that? I I suspect there might be quite a few people who are thinking that and and might eventually do that. Um, my position is, is this: that if you form an entity for good business purposes then I think you're perfectly fine doing that and taking advantage of this law. If the only reason why you're creating an entity is to fit within this law, I I think you might have a risk there. Your motivation, one of the things that the IRS in the state of of California likes to uh, to attack taxpayers on is tax-motivated transactions. If you're doing something simply for the tax motivation, Generally speaking, you're putting yourself at risk that the IRS and state of California might not respect your structure. So you need a good business purpose. And maybe that's fine. Maybe you're going to set up a family limited partnership for estate planning purposes. Or maybe you have rental property in your individual name and you would like to put it in a partnership or LLC for limited liability protection. You know, those would be good business purposes. So I would encourage anybody that's thinking about uh, forming an entity to try to fit into this law, really think about it from the, the perspective of, of, you know, what are the business purposes that I could form an entity so I can fall into this law? Yeah, so to your, you know, a lot of people in Southern California have, or all California for that matter, have a lot of rental properties. Oftentimes, mm-hmm. Just due to refinances or what have you, those properties fall in and out of LLCs just because it makes it mechanically easier to complete those transactions. So people could get their properties back in the right asset protection wrapper, the LLC, right? And then, but the LLC, and because it's rental and because you got depreciation, maybe the income's not, it's not going to be at the level that you'd like. And so what do you think about um, if someone was comfortable with the risk uh, transferring in appreciated stock and potentially selling the appreciated stock within that entity to make it qualified income? It, it, it possibly could work. The, the, the pass-through entity tax under AB 150 applies to, if you're a California resident, to all sources of income. So gains from sale of marketable securities would be included in the pass-through entity tax calculation. It comes down to uh, you know, business purpose again, though. Why, why are you putting marketable securities into your LLC immediately before sale? Um, if there's good reason for that, then I, I think, I think you know, mechanically it can work. The other thing is um, you know, if somebody owns the rental property in an individual name and put an LLC, that's step one. But remember, a single-member LLC does not qualify under AB 150 for this pass through any tax. It's got to be a multi-member LLC tax as a partnership. Um, so you, you know, if you're just a single individual uh, putting it in an LLC, you, you might have to put in somebody else as a partner, maybe one of your children or grandchildren for estate planning purposes. If you're married, there's an election to be made in California that if uh, that you can file a tax return as a partnership with the husband and wife as the two partners. Does it have to be a controlling interest? No, of course Could you not. put a non-controlling no. interest in? Yes. There you go. Okay. How are you positioning this with clients, and what are you looking, what strategies are you guys looking at? Well, I, talking a lot about it with clients, um, trying to do our year-end projections, get an early start on year-end projections to calculate the projected California tax liability at the individual level, um, anticipating that there might be limitations due to alternative tax, again, subject to further guidance, um, trying to measure what that limitation could be, 
And then with many of my clients, at least, a lot of my clients have multiple partnerships and multiple S corporations. So then it comes down to identifying which partnerships S corporations are good candidates. And then if it's a partnership, do we need to amend the partnership agreements to specially allocate income or specially allocate these credits to the extent that the IRS might, will allow that? And again, we don't know if the IRS will allow that. So uh, again, we have a lot of questions without answers, but um, I don't want the guidance to come out in December and then scramble. So <laughs> I, I'm doing my best with each client to do the, the foundational work of let's, let's see what you have. Let's make some assumptions as to what the answers are going to be to these questions. And, and let's get a preliminary plan ready to execute once we, we receive more guidance from the state of California and, and the IRS. It just seems like they're going to wait till December. Well, um, <laughs> I, I hope not. But I think historically you're right. Historically, you know, they like to to do that. Yes. There's one other thing I'd like to mention, um, which you know I often see, and and I suspect you know, for some of the people listening might have, um, if you have a, a multi-state entities. You know, think of rental properties that are in not just in California, but in other states. Or if you have an operating business that does business across state lines, this credit becomes even more problematic. Um, it's it's not impossible to take this credit, but it becomes problematic that it, 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 it increases the risk that the credit might be limited. And, and let me try to explain Let's say you do business in the state of Oregon. Oregon's tax rate's 9.9%. At least that's the highest tax rate in Oregon. California's tax rate, highest tax rate, 13.3%. So historically, normally, the way multi-state taxation works is if you're a California resident paying taxes in, let's say, the state of Oregon, and you know, Oregon actually is a special exception because there's a... a, a tax treaty between California and Oregon. So maybe it's not the best uh, the best state to use, but it, it works in Hawaii or other states at high taxes. But if you if you have uh, if you're paying taxes in Oregon at nine point nine percent and you're paying California taxes three point thirteen point three, generally speaking, California will credit you the nine point nine percent taxes paid in the other state. So you're paying nine point nine in the other state and you might be paying three point four in California for a total of 13.3. Makes sense, you're not paying more taxes, it's just a question of how yep. you divvy up the taxes. Yep. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, there's there's nuances, I'm not gonna get into nuances, but that's you know, generally how it's supposed to work. Now imagine layering this pastoral entity tax. The pastoral entity pays 9.3%. It's not, the pastoral entity is not gonna get a credit for the Oregon taxes paid. The individual is still gonna get the credit for the Oregon taxes paid. Well, if the individual is paying uh, 7% alternative minimum tax and then takes the other, the Oregon tax of 9.9%, then the individual is going to pay zero tax but not get a refund for the excess paid to Oregon. And so what do you have? You have the California individual paying zero tax. You have the pass-through entity paying 9.3% tax to California. And then you have the individual paying a 9.9% tax to Oregon. You're paying 18.9% tax rates. With no refund. With no refunds. You just volunteered for like five, you know, five, six percent more in taxes. So you, 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 and again, this is all formula driven, mathematical driven. So if you're in a multi-state situation, you, you really need to run the numbers before you make the decision where you're going to you do this pass-through entity tax. Yeah, Maybe it's careful. fine if you do business in Nevada, which is a 0% tax rate state, or, or or Colorado, which is a 5% tax rate. Maybe the numbers work out better, but until you run those numbers, it's not something you just want to make a decision on. Well, despite all the complexity with the math, uh, this is a massive opportunity for clients. And it... it it's going to require some some real headspace and conversation and projections and getting down to the math and to your point, Ken, guidance from 
the government to decide, okay, how's this all going to work? Uh, but the opportunity is pretty substantial, and it was taken away from us back in 2018. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. It's just, it's just work, right? It's just getting down into the numbers and figuring it out. So getting into the end of the year, right? I mean, you got uh, another set of returns to file here, and then the end of the year is going to come up, and then all the estate planning. So it's going to get busy towards the end of the year. So how long do you think... When's a good time for clients to start talking to their CPAs about this? If you have extended your 2020 tax returns to October 15th, I would I would finish that process, file your 2020 tax return, and then immediately start talking to your CPA about it. Um, right now, CPAs are very busy because September 15th and October yep. 15th are big deadlines. So, so honestly, probably wait till October 16th. Before you talk to your Maybe the 18th. Day. Give you guys a couple of days off, a couple and then pick days. it up. Yeah, right. We're Ken, this is awesome stuff. I look forward to you know when we get that additional guidance. Uh, if it's meaningful and there's some real gotchas in there that are worthy of another podcast, we can have you join us again. But this was thanks for joining me today. This is awesome stuff, and look forward to crunching some numbers with you. I guess. Thank you, Kyle. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. So, Ken, if anybody, if our listening audience wants to reach out to you uh, and they have some questions, well, how can they get in touch with you? Sure. My, uh, thank you, Kyle. My email address is ken.vandam, that's V A N D A M M E, at ey.com. And like I said, I'm with Ernst Young in the San Diego office. Awesome stuff. Yeah, Kyle, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I mean, it, it seems like there. If we have to wait for government guidance, you know, and like you said, they're going to drag their feet on it, and it, it almost seems like they're, uh, you know, they're kind of tricking us in a way, and uh, that, that's that's no bueno. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say they're tricking you. I would say they're delaying it so that less people take action on them. Right? Yeah, there you go. And that's that's the reality of it. That, that's a great way to put it. So, uh, speaking of taking action, I'm I'm hoping that the you know the listening audience will take action and reach out to Ken or you yourself. Um, can you give your contact information one more time, Kyle? Yeah, it can be reached at K Malmstrom at Centura Wealth, K M A L M S T R O M at centurawealth.com or you can give us a call 858-771-9500. We're easy to find. It's not hard. Super easy. Make that step. Take that step, and uh, and reach out to one of these two professionals. Get some better sleep at night. You'll have a, a better plan moving forward. Ken, again, thank you so much for being on the show, and of course, Kyle, thank you for bringing him back on the show. But our last thank you is always reserved for you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when they come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Centura Wealth Advisory, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Centura Wealth Advisory. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Centura Wealth Advisory, Centura, is an SEC-registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in San Diego, California. Centura and its representatives are in compliance with the current registration and notice filing requirements imposed on SEC-registered investment advisors, in which Centura maintains clients. Centura may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Tax relief varies based on client circumstances and all clients do not achieve the same results. 